We're back, and you're listening to another episode of Meaningful People Podcast. I'm one of the co-hosts, Yaakov Langer. We never did something like that. And I'm Nachi Gordon. There you go. That's fun. Um, and on this week's episode, we have two guests, the couple who started Bone Olam, Rabbi and Mrs. Bachner. It was actually our first time sitting down with two guests at once, so it was pretty amazing. And this is a power couple. These are two people that have brought into the world over 8,000 children. It's crazy. Boney Olam is responsible in part for two healthy babies a day. It's, it's so crazy. They, 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 they talk about how they started, why they started Boney Olam, a lot of you know their personal struggles, and they were very open. Um, it, this episode was definitely the hardest questions that Nahi and I had to ask. And we were allowed to ask, and they were so honest and so raw, and they're they're literally changing the world and helping so many people. And we're very excited for you to hear this episode. And so. Of course, a big mention to AMR Pharmacy, our partners over there at AMR Pharmacy, the best pharmacy in the world, and DailyGiving.org. Who you hear about them soon? Enjoy. Welcome to the Meaningful People Podcast, the podcast where we talk to people who are... Meaningful. Yeah, that sounds good. Here we are with uh, Rabbi and Mrs. Bachner, right? Not Rabbitson? Mrs. No way. Specifically Mrs. Bachner. (laughs) Sounds like a conscious decision. I'll easier give up on being Rabbi than she getting the name Rabbitson. Oh, right? interesting. No, I'm not going to take Rabbitson. I said, yeah, he's you on your team. I'd rather give up my title of rabbi oh, good. easier than you would attach yourself to being a Rabbitson. So let, let's go back. Let's go back. Uh, we're, first of all, where are you two originally from? Bar Park, Benzenhurst. Okay, that's simple. And uh, Close enough. And you're... We're both Baba the Hasidim. Mm-hmm. So this is how, you know, it's, it was an easy, same HLA factor as we speak. Both come from the same origin. Even in Europe, our parents come from the same origin. They both were raised more or less from the same rabbis. They went to the same yeshivas. And um, when you get together in Baba for a yontif, you get to meet people that you don't meet all year because everybody comes for yontif. So her parents used to walk in a lot from Benzenhurst to Bar Park. We lived in Bar Park, and somebody is struck of the idea this might be a good match, and this is the rest is history. We got married. What year did you guys get married? 1979. What, what, what was the date? March. Nahi, what are you doing? Let's see if you remember. <laughs> Nahi, I'm not I a fan of that March question. March 29, 79. Very good. Wow. You see, no, that's a home run. I just, see, that's I a just, home run, yes. Not stop a home run. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, we spoke about it before, and he told me to ask that question. <laughs> oh, you planned it. I want to let you know that there's a guy who calls up my husband every year yeah. on the day of my birthday to remind him. <laughs> serious. Is that true? A good is that true? He makes sure his friends call him up. No, so. it happens to be her birthday is two days before Pesach. So it's very busy in the yeah, house. Yeah, it's very She doesn't tell you really that I work so hard for Pesach in the house. I don't remember when the birthday comes up. <laughs> this so. year for COVID, I will say definitely he worked. Okay, this yeah. year. But I, I, you guys are famous for Bone Olam. And I, I want to just dive into that story. How did it start? And it could be you mentioned this a bunch of times, but there's a bunch of audiences that are listening now and they're curious. They, they don't even really know. So I just want to say one word. It's really, Ben Olim really was founded and organized and taken off the ground because of my wife, Hani. It was not, people think it was me. I always correct that it was my wife. Matter of fact, I was not with her in the beginning because I really had no interest to devote my life of being an organization person running around for 21 years so far. Hashem shall for more. Raising funds and being busy with the whole yeah, world's problems. Yeah, but we didn't even know that it was going to be like That's this. true. But it was her idea, so she it, will it, explain it, how she took okay. it Okay. First of all, we never thought that this was going to be an organization. We started it just to help people. Because it was a monumental thought of going and opening an organization. I never did this before. We're a couple of ladies, five ladies to be exact, that got together. It was interesting how we got together, but we were called. I would, said at one point that I wanted to help uh, people to go for treatment. And how do you help with money? Because the information they might have been getting or figuring it out or going to the library, doing some homework. But actually the money, the funds, there wasn't any. The, the insurance, it wasn't covered by insurance or very minute amount was covered by insurance. So 
I said, yeah, we want to do this. And we got together. What year is this around? Nine, in, the first meeting was in 1998 in December, Hanukkah time. Okay, that's like when you were born, no? We yeah, were sorry, incorporated in April. And our first event was like sort of coming out of the closet. Uh, because nobody spoke about the subject. It was super taboo at that time. Super, super taboo. And we actually did it in a house in Bar Park. And each of us, five ladies, went and called our friends. We, I didn't go to a colony at that time. It wasn't like I had a very vast amount of friends at that time. Because, you know, when you go to a colony, you, you get a whole bunch of friends. You have your, your grade mates, but even at that point... It, it, you start moving away it was pretty many years after we were married. So we invited, everyone invited their friends and it was, a, the party was like, it, it put us in a mind frame of how much this is really needed. We had no clue that people would really come to this party. And so this showed us, this egged us on to go and say, hey, we got to go ahead with this, go forth. Tried getting my husband on board at that point, but he said he thought I was really crazy. He said, why are you doing this? You didn't have enough in your life. What I said, but I want to help people. And I really, really, the thought of why I wanted to do this in the first place is because when we were actually going for treatment, we met people and they, if they failed, they, or they went and they called me up. I made friends with them and they said, we need, um, maybe we can borrow some money. And so I said, you know, I realize that people are not going for treatment because they don't have funds. And I know ourselves, we actually had to save up money till we were able to go for something, any treatment. And today, Bar Hashem, people have a place where to call for the knowledge, for where to go, you know, what they should be doing, which is the best place. And as far as funds, yes. The funds, that's the main reason why we actually open, because we realize people are sitting home. Maybe they might know where to go, but they don't have the funds. That's unreal. That's pretty cool. I mean, you guys basically are now responsible partly for over 9,000 children. Yeah, we're children. close to 9,000. And this is only the, the children that we actually paid for their treatments. We don't have a clue how many people we actually helped just by phone, we don't ask for their names. They call my husband, they call different counselors in the organization, and they say, I'm not, I don't need funds, I just need to be guided, or I have a question about something. They don't become a PIN number yet, so that's why we don't follow up on them. So, so we some, have no, yeah. unless they actually call and let us know, you know, you helped us. So if somebody- So there's a lot- There's a lot more. A lot, do you, do many, you know, many thousands Do you know of, of any like grandkids because of Boniolum? Absolutely. We you, were two years ago. We were the first time we got a few invitations to weddings. weddings. When the invitation and came, I looked at the names. The names really didn't mean anything to me. Then I saw in the back they wrote the pin number for over twenty years ago. Very interesting. I couldn't find it in the computer anymore because I think they were missing a digit. They only we added digits later on. Right. I couldn't place them. They actually invited me. But I did not go because I wasn't sure if they really wanted me, they wanted to see me there. Right. But it was nice. And today, by now, there's a lot of people that married off children. But Hashem have really grandchildren. <laughs> so, like like my wife said, we don't keep count. Hashem keeps count. Whatever. At, at the time, Rabbi Bachner, why? What part of you didn't want to do it? You, did you not believe in it? Were you emotionally just drained from your experience? <laughs> Number one. Number one, we have gone through, me and my wife went through a very hard time. I mean, this is something which we will never forget. Our road, our struggle for fertility lasted for over 20 years. And we didn't leave a stone unturned. I mean, we did everything. And I remember the beginning, everybody had a dream of having a large family. But, you know, when the, when the, when the numbers were settling in and then the news was being the, understood by us, what we, so we, all that was happening was for one child. Shem, give me just one child. I'll be very happy. And when that did not happen to, I was basically was so broken that I just, the word children was like, was was a beer to me. It was like a monster. I, I was, so I didn't, I was afraid to get, get, you know, it's not easy to deal with people a whole day, 24 hours a day, basically many times with the same issues that you were not matzlich. And yet I was able to help them have babies. So this was a thought which I was not ready somehow to dive into, but actually in the end, it's my wife that got me to do it. 
And I think that's an important point to bring out because when we finally came home the last time, our last appointment with the doctor, he 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 had tears in his eyes. He says, you know, I love you guys so much, but I got to tell you, the road has come to an end. It's time for closure. I mean, we knew that they were not doing good. I mean, we weren't silly. But when you hear that line, it becomes like, you know, you, you get finally the, the knock over your head. So we're driving home in the car, FDR South, I was driving, and we're both very deep in thought, quiet, because you heard finally now your, your, your final destination, so to speak, that you're never going to have children, unfortunately. And all of a sudden, my wife perks up and says, you know, Shlemy, I think now is the time we should start. We should do it with other people. And I looked at her, uh, are you with it? I mean, are you, you okay? <laughs> she says, yes. I said, honey, how, how can we even think of it? We just heard that. I'll never forget those words from my wife. My wife said, Shlemy, Hashem told us no, we're going to respond with a resounding yes. And this is how she finally got me to see this in a different light. And it took time. It was Avium, that coming up, Avium Kipper. I was going to shoe. She was probably going to deny the story, but the story is true. <laughs> well, I she's here now, so I don't, lie in <laughs> I don't know which story. She just got really nervous. I was, dressed, I was dressed with my kittle and my mother ready to go to shul, and she blocked me by the door, and she says, you're not going to shul until you promise me you're going to join me by night. You remember? It's a long time ago. A long time ago. <laughs> and, and I was, actually, I was taken aback. It was a struggle in me all the time, even when I said no, is because... I was afraid that who wants to be who wants to be a, a, a fundraiser for your entire life and be involved. Yeah, it's it's not an easy task. But he's actually terrific at sure, it. The bottom line that was I want to let I, you I, it was Avian Kippers. So I was emotionally, uh, you know, charged. I said yes, Matsim Kipper. I remember after we broke the fast, I asked my wife, "Okay, boss, what's my what's my first job?" And the answer was, "There's no money in the bank." This is how the job started. It was Matzah Shabbos, Matzah Yom Kippur. The next morning, I knew we were, I even remember the amount where read in the bank was $5,000. And that's when the, the whole journey started. And to be very honest, let's be, we have reached heights that a, another human being has not reached. I, I know where I've reached the heights. We were there for people, literally taking them out of the graves. They were long given up. I was in Slich with people in so many complicated, but I was smart enough always to understand that is really Hashem's hand. I mean, the Hatzlucha was L'malam in the Hashem always gave us this chus to always have very good people attached to us. We had people from day one that knew medicine so well that basically we guided doctors really what to do. From day one, we told doctors what medication to use and how we want the cycles done. First of all, we ourselves knew a vast amount of medicine at those times. Today, we have much younger generation doing it because everything changed by then, by now. But we were actually hands-on advice, physics, support, money, doctors, medicine, hashgokha, rabbonim, everything started off with us, just us two people. We had a little fax machine in one of our bedrooms. This was the entire office. And that's when it started. And Baruch Hashem, it just took off. Six months later, I was davening in Shul, I davening above us. And for learning, I used to go out a whole group to learn to, to go to a quick communion because of the other place, the big shul takes very long. And one time after davening, one of my friends got up and said, guys, we're all here together, friends. Shlomo Bachner and his wife opened up an organization. It's called Bani Olam. And I sank through the floor. Oh my gosh, what is this guy doing now here? He says, we are all going to become part of it. I was gonna, I don't tell you what I was gonna do to him. That Matzah Shabbos, we had a meeting in one of our friends' house. This went so fast. And we decided then and there, a bunch of friends, that we're going to make the first dinner in Barapak and Kahal Chasidim. You know, Kahal Chasidim, the yeah. little, little bris hole, whatever. It's a small little tiny Yeah. Room. And I was so, I told them, guys, do it in a dining room. Don't do it in a <laughs> hole. Who's going to come? It was the first dinner we made. And we did Kenai Nahara very, very well. Very, very well. What year was this? 1980 or 81? No, what are you talking about? If we started in 1981. I mean, 1990, 2001, maybe? Maybe, 2001. I think I mean, it was probably 2001. 2001. And, and the men's started till he got on board. That's until when we I got, saw. You know, different I saw we had such ready. a siyata de shemai. There was a, I was already afraid to say no because I felt like Hashem wants me to do it. And and, and every time when things got very hard, I used to say, what do you want to do? And then Hashem gave me a tremendous success. You know, Hashem plays with people, I have to tell you. There's the old, I'm not, I'm, 
I'm not, I'm not kidding. There were many times that I decided I had enough. You know, we used to go to people for money. People used to tell me such a absurd comments. I will only give money if I can be 100% assured they'll have a baby. Who, who can promise her? <laughs> I, I can try. It was a, <laughs> right. So, and people came up with such, and, and, and some of them were really not nice. By far and large, people were nice. I'm not going to say no. But now and then you used to get the or I used to invest it in somebody so much work and, and it didn't work out and I felt very bad, got close to the people. So I used to complain to Hashem, this worked like magic. Like a, few, a little short while later, I was matzlich with something so good in medicine that I felt like again, oh, Hashem wants me to be, Hashem wants me to be. And the rest is history. I mean, we took over, we were today global. In every country you have a Bain Elam. Not all of them are, are run by me, but the medical part is run by us. And there's not a second in the day worldwide that the phone doesn't ring at a Boneolum office, whether it's London, Manchester, Belgium, Australia, Montreal, Israel is huge over it. And here, the entire United States from the East Coast to the West Coast. I saw a crazy stat that uh, on average, I mean, you could correct me if I'm off here, two Boneolum babies are born a day? A day. Hmm. It's it's so right now, like that's, right now. That, that's, that's worldwide. We're talking worldwide. Yeah, yeah, worldwide. It's like, Google, it's like yeah. a Google stat, you know. <laughs> Actually, sometimes it's one point seven more, but this year might be a little bit less because we didn't do that many trips because of COVID. Right. Uh, so it might reflect a little bit. That less also must have been very difficult. Very for right. a lot of people. That, it was yeah. a that, very that's, difficult time. That's Those, a story on its own. They were sitting home alone and they know that it's not a time to go for COVID. A lot of people actually did call and said, I want to go anyway. And we said you know, it's not a very good idea because once they start testing and if you are in contact with someone and you're they in the middle of your cycle, the they just cancel you. So yeah. everything, and you, you know, lost your money. You lost your money. Not only that, when a couple goes for treatment, they go on medication. It's hormonally. It makes you, you know, it, it affects you. It's not an easy road. It's not an easy road. And the time, it, it, it just, all that time that you invested in, then boom, it's, you can't even finish. Right. Can it's you can you hard. talk about that process? Let's say once someone comes to you, yes, and so, from like A to Z, what's what's that look like? For, so the, yeah. there's not really a one A to Z because people come at various stages, right, and with various knowledge issues. they have various issues in which doctors are involved. But we'll, we can t we'll try to take the middle road. The couple gets married, three four years go through. There's no children. And they have been trying already, let's say, at least for two years, 24, 18 to 24 tries. This is the medical terminology they use if you try at least 18, 18, 24 times. And there's no children. So they would come to us if they are beginners. Many people begin the process on their own. They come to me a little bit more educated, a little bit down the road when they need more from me. But we try to hook them up with doctors that will do basic blood work. This, mm -hmm. is, this is our policy. If somebody understands medicine very well, knows that there are certain tests that you could do, male or female, and you would get the cue of, we're dealing with something which is really, really dangerous, we gotta do action now. So well, we trained our staff, first let's do a certain blood work for her and blood work for him. Let's first know that we're not dealing with something which is time, time of essence. Once we get back to blood work and we see that we are on a safe ground, there's other issues, then we can take it a little bit easy. But you can sometimes know from blood work, where well, a woman is unfortunately something which is called POF, premature ovarian failure. She's about to not to have any more eggs in there. And the same things with male. We can mm -hmm. see on blood work there's, there's a major issue from from his part. So those we right away get involved in, in a heavy duty way. But the other stuff we try to make it easier. And there's there's a whole host of little things that a person can do before he goes for the major stuff. So we're not going to go through all medicals. We can stay there all night. But sometimes just medication might kick in. And there's different levels of medication. There's little, the various levels of hormones you can give a person to kick in. Cycle should be more or less in, able to, she should be able to conceive. If everything really doesn't work out after a while, then we start thinking of bigger, of bigger, of bigger stuff, which usually ends up being an IVF in vitro, which in vitro, to many people who don't understand the blessing that Hashem gave us with in vitro, think it's something so terrible. But in all honesty, in vitro was the greatest gift Hashem gave for Claudius, especially because by now, thousands of babies are born a year through IVF for various different reasons. Whether a lot of people today know they're struggling with a genetic issue, by now we're much smarter than a generation before was because pediatricians the last few years, any kid, any child that was not well, which didn't fit exactly more or less the, the, the norm they were in, they would do genetic testing. So people know a lot more stuff now than they, when the, 
generation before we know, comes to do Shaduchim, we are aware of more issues. Or if Chas people do get married and they find out there's an issue which plays itself out in a horrible way where the sick baby is born or she cannot get pregnant for, for no good reason and we, we finally pin it down because of genetic issues. So IVF basically has opened up for us the door for thousands of Eden every year. And actually, I we don't push people for an IVF, but since I try to explain every couple, don't be nervous, but the small, we have something great at the end of the line in case if we need it. There's so like you, an emergency, there's like a fire extinguisher. Right, you're gonna have a baby. If there's a sperm in the neck, we're gonna have a baby. Question is only how far we have the endurance to go to the small, because many people, if they have a little bit of endurance, they're gonna become pregnant naturally also with minor stuff. So if we can't, we gotta do the, the bigger stuff. So this is more or less a, a, a regular off the mill case. But sometimes you get cases which we know before we start, we're already walking in with a major issue. Take Rahman al Islam, unfortunately, cancer. We're responsible for hundreds and hundreds of children who are born because we were there for a boy or a girl that was diagnosed mm-hmm. with cancer. And we were able, we have the pull for that. Enough time before they start chemo or any treatment to get from her or from him, whatever we need for uh, to build a family later on. Because mm-hmm. we have literally hundreds of kids, and this does not come easy. This comes with a lot of mysterious nefesh. It comes to me in my mind. I was once sitting in my house doing Hanukkah. Lecture. It was the fifth day of Hanukkah. I wrote it up someplace, and I got a call while I'm sitting with the Hanukkah. Lecture. A man with an Israeli accent. He, he wants to talk to you, but there was so much background noise. I said, I can't even hear you. He says, no, that's good, because we're now sitting at a cedar side door for my son. Do you remember? Uh, do I remember? How am I supposed to remember? <laughs> but he reminded me something, which I did remember. He says, you know, for, it was six or seven years before that, this man came from Metzisro with a son that was in the line, very, very sick. I remember now, then I remember the story, very ill. It was a Hanukkah time. And he called me, when he was in America, well, somebody told him to call us. Mm-hmm. We needed to say for this boy, for because he was going to go through a treatment that it's going to be, everything will be knocked out. It won't be able to have children on his own. And I remember, he, so he tells me now, you know, I was walking down myself, a stranger in a country, I don't know the language. My son never was in bed, you know, getting ready for, for treatments. And I was walking down the long, dark corridor in Sloan's and Kettering, and I'm calling a total stranger, Shlema Wachner. And I told you that time my story, and actually we got into action. An hour or two later, we were ready in action to get an OR to do whatever we have to do. He says, now is the seat to say, though, we're home. And he did, when he ends up telling me how bittersweet would have been the seat to say, though, if he only would have saved his life and he would have no future to go on. And B'Ruch Hashem, now we know there's a future for him too. This is a real seat to say, though. He called me while I was doing my Hanukkah because that was the night the seat to in Israel. 50 of Han- by him it was probably 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, but us was just the beginning of the night, a six, seven hour difference. Yes, so I know that I was like, uh, many people, do, but I also understand that it's not me. There's a Seat Adishmai in that, because you can't, you can't, you can't do this on your own. You saw that Hashem. You see Hashem's hand in that. Oh, Absolutely. Every single Absolutely. day. Absolutely, because we are involved in big stuff, not small. Somebody needs a job of cloma. We're not, this is very small. We're, we're dealing with major, major complications. Well, Shiduchim. Creating worlds. <laughs> while on the, she was driving me here because I was on the phone. I was just trying to decide now a Shiduch for a man, which the other side has three or four members in the family that has a certain cancer. We're trying to figure out which mutation. The man is asking me for the future of his child. Wow. And I told him, I am not this big person that you, you, I can only give you down to earth common sense advice. I can't give you, I'm not in Shemaim but we do have a vast amount of experience. And if I need a question, I'm connected to many licensed geneticists. I can get an answer in an hour or two, what we need. Without going to the research, spend six months to get, you know. Right. So there is a ton, a ton of Shemai. So this actually is the driving force behind me. Because I know it's not me, it's uh, nothing to be proud of, not to be a big shot about anything, because that's look. So whenever I feel like I, I'm gonna walk away a little bit from it, I get this nudge, you know, there's somebody hmm. pushing you with it. This is the honest truth. This is why we're here. Do you, do you, well, I have two questions. First of all, I'm going to ask both of them. You'll answer if you know the answer. What, first of all, what's the average cost, if there is an average cost? And then the second question is, what's the most expensive case that Bonet Olam uh, dealt with? So we'll take with the last one first. The most expensive case is a girl. Her name is Devoidala. 
She lives in Muncie. She cost me, me and Boyne, she cost $304,000. Wow. Three or four, this family had three children before that. All three children died. Because father and mother both had different fatal mutations. The chance for them to have a healthy child, to find one embryo that's clean from the father's side to the mother's side is like really picking a needle in a haystack. They were for eight years, my patient. And we tried over and over until we found Hashem, one one embryo after so many. And this baby was born, Devoid of LeBron. It's the only picture I have for me, of my baby in my office. And they parents signed there for her. Thanks for not giving up on us. Wow. This wow. is the most expensive one. Most expensive. Average is really very hard to say because male infertility, unfortunately, has its own price, its own average. Much more expensive than it's only a female issue. Well, what are the numbers around? <clears throat> People keep listening. A basic guys. IVF, a basic IVF with medications is around from 18 to 20 grand. Yes, sometimes you get away with 17, some you can get away with 19. It, it's more or less, I'm giving you an average. If you do the basic stuff by a decent center, yes, you can find centers to do it for much cheaper. We're talking about decent centers. It's more or less, this is the price. Sometimes you get cheaper, two, three thousand dollars, but more or less this runs the price. If you have to add on today, which is very common, chromosomal testing or PGD, which means pre genetic diagnostic, if we're dealing with genetic issues, the price goes up dramatically, at least from six to eight thousand dollars, varying in the hospital. So there are centers which I get a little bit cheaper because they do it, they outsource the genetic testing, some do it in house, and then you have to check who comes back with the proper results. I mean, you can go to a lab. I did, we just had a neighbor. Last year, around the block from us, her daughter went to a certain hospital. I don't want to mention any names. And all of her embryos came back from the lab X. In other words, none of them are good. I remember the mother called me up. She was like, she, she, my daughter's not going to get I told her, listen, take all these embryos. Tell the, tell the hospital to ship it out. I gave her a different lab just to go to. Meanwhile, Hashem helped. Her daughter got pregnant naturally. But when I did come back with them, I said, almost except when everything came back really fine. Some labs, just to be secure, they're not gonna make a wrong move if they're not 100% sure, they'll like, sort of don't use it because it's all right. So it's, there's, there's a, you have, there's a lot of experience in it. And like in every business, we know the people in the field already for 40 years. I mean, I know these guys from when they, I tried to get for doctors, good doctors, a good job. That's how big we are with the radio. But this, this is the third generation that I'm working you with. You actually uh, got some doctors yes, in their yes, jobs and right. centers. No, mm. you really did. So the averaging I'm is... I'm talking is, about from... Really? Yeah, so yeah. averaging is a little bit uh, very hard to say. It's uh, Sometimes you think it'll be even the first time. It takes it two, three times. And the price goes up. But it's, the average in the IVF, I would say, was 80, 18, from 17 to 18. To, to 25, if you have to go with... Uh, with, uh, That's not a male factor. Chromosomal, uh, right. Male factor is 45,000. Approximately. One, really? One yeah. Try. And, and I heard that that the males struggle more to Ma do Because it's less what you can do. Really? Less what you can do. Uh, medicine has not opened up for us that much, but it's getting better. I'm not going to say no, but still very, very, very Has expensive. it advanced much in the last 20 years, medicine in this particular field? Nothing actually much new came Except they're genetic, work, they're working except on genetic, it. but they refined very, very well whatever they were doing until now. So there are moments later. They're adding on little things which might help, which improve the results. Right, but not the end results. Right, you have such an extreme type of job because on one entity, you know, you help someone start a family and build an eternity. And then on the other end, you also probably have to deal with some cases where people... That's the worst. That's time. the worst. That's the, the worst. When Does they come back from the doctor and the doctor told them there's nothing more to do, and usually I get the appointment in the end because nobody in my organization wants to deal with that. Very, very painful. Does, does it happen a lot? Yeah, unfortunately. It happens. It happens. Listen, a it's not uh, us. It's what Hashem wants. No, no, but this is... Um, it's, it's, it happens, I, I and had, they have to go through a process of dealing with it. Now, yeah. does Boney Olam help out with that process afterwards, whether it's yes, counseling see, they or... Actually, that's, they that's actually come and job. sit down with my husband, and they talk, and they talk it through. And it's something that you, listen, you have to get busy with other things in your life and go help other people. But, but I do want to say... The basis why I can give them chizik is, again, what I said before, we have had cases in our experience. Right. They were, when I say totally written off, I mean 100% written off the chart. 
yet there was like to have a child. We've so, seen this. Right. We've actually we, seen we, this. We, for instance, have our own lab. It's called AAS, Andrology Associates. It's something which we do something very different than most hospitals do. It, without going online in details, it's basically doing a semen analysis that can take six to eight hours. So if you don't find anything in the lab, we might find a cell, two cells, three cells out of 30, 40 million, and we can have a baby from it. Now, we had ba- people that have gone through the biggest and the best doctors, and they were told they're never going to have kids. And these doctors usually are right. I mean, I work with them. Now. Yet, they were, they were, every now and then, mm. pops up another one. We did fine by him. So, you, you know what it teaches us? Hashem says, a human cannot close the door. It's me that closes the door. So, therefore, this is always a little bit a, a, a sounding where I can start a book where I can start giving people some kind of a chizik, but I tell them right away this is very I don't lie this is far rare few in between but being a yid you know, and believe in Hashem there's about to hold on to it has happened before people were matzlich are you tired? <laughs> that is a, a, an Actually, understatement yes a... and no and that's okay. a very interesting question he I'm, hardly sleeps if, in a physical it's a question sense, for you too also I don't <laughs> let him drive we once had a terrible accident. And he fell asleep driving. Uh, no, so no, I guess you are tired. <laughs> <laughs> I am physically. I am, but yet, but even when I fall into bed, I, my mind goes, "Did I answer this person?" But I should have answered. You know, it just goes along with you. Twenty, even shops, you know, I never have peace because maybe because it doesn't, maybe I should have done this. Maybe I start first, or I'm going to call them. I, I thought of something. So that if you live it, you live it. One thing I've learned. You cannot be involved in such an organization if you want to have a comfortable private life and just go in from nine to five. It doesn't work. Right. You can't serve Claudia. So not that I chose it, by the way. I can't take credit for being such a Your wife though. did. <laughs> she did. I, I, I want to, you know, correct something. She didn't here. want you to have a nine to five. So we something. did not know. Hey, that's true. We, we, it, this was not like, you know, some people want to open us. up a company. They want to open up an organization. They have a vision. <laughs> I didn't have a vision. The only vision that I had was we wanted to help people and i said and like there were a lot of rabbanim that were very naysayers to us remember i didn't have my husband at that time part of it and a lot of rabbanim that we went to and said eh, don't start it don't do it and why what, what why were they because you're because never, never going to be able to raise the amount of money that you, really that you need. need you heard the the, the, the monies that we're, we're talking about how much number one can women raise you know, mm-hmm. we can, but they're, they're it, a little bit limited. And we're brand new when we were new at this organization. And so we I, we didn't think, we'll help a couple of people. That was, but then as we grew Remember you and said the needs. One baby at a time. Right. We said mm. one baby at a time. And as the needs grew, in other words, someone would call up and say, I have this and this problem. We didn't have such a project yet. It became a project because my husband or any of the councils would say, you know what, we're going to check into this. We never did this before. We never worked with such a kind of an issue. We're going to do some homework. We're going to check with doctors and centers, and we'll get back to you. We, we do not play doctor here. Right. We use the right facilities, the resources. right doctors. Yeah. We, we, we built up relationship with many doctors all over the world. So we know who's really good at what they do. And instead of the couple going themselves to this place and that place, and they're wasting so much time and so much money, we're, we're saving them money. Besides us helping pay for it, we're saving money and time for them because we're directing them right. where to go and what to do next. Oh my gosh, I am exhausted. Are you okay? <laughs> oh my gosh. Do you realize it's the middle of the episode? People are like, what is going on? <laughs> Nahi just chilling with bone ale on people. Ooh, why are you so exhausted, Nahi? I- I'm just tired because, you know, usually we get these sleeping pills delivered, but my pharmacy, nowhere to be found. They didn't deliver the pills. ZBS again? Come, Nahi, Unreal. you, you didn't make the switch to AMR Pharmacy. I didn't. It, 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 and we're advertising for them. You got to really, you know, promote them and actually just use them. Yeah, and I haven't slept in three days. And, and, and for those listening, it's a joke. I don't have sleeping problems, trust me. But he does take sleeping pills. No, okay. <laughs> but you might. <laughs> so yes. whatever it may be, AMR Pharmacy is there for you. Never be late on your pills. Never forget to take anything. Have them organized. 
have the pharmacy of the future. I wanted to like list off a bunch of like things that people take pills for, but like it would be too staged. Like I don't know what the medic guys, you any medications that you take that you need and you need a pharmacy that's reliable if you're in New York, New Jersey, they're the place to go. They're really awesome and and shout out to my main man. I won't say his name, M, he helped me out with something and boom, they hook it up. Really? Like hassle free that's what you want when it comes to taking important medications and transitioning we'd like to welcome a new advertiser a new sponsor a new friend of but before ours. we get that let's tell them how to get the amr oh yeah that's amr what... farm rx.com that's a m r p h a r m r x.com or you can pick up the phone if you're from the stone age and call 848-222-1110 now and, trans- and you can send them a telegraph at yes yeah, so you can fax them at, yeah. uh but though before it's right like they're they're we, we say this because we believe in them we love them and and they will change your lives if you let them now go now transitioning to our new friends a big family we have over here. But say hello to dailygiving.org. Amazing. Dailygiving.org is an organization that takes your dollar, one dollar every day, and they distribute it to 42 organizations, a new organization every single day getting that dollar. I'm jealous. Today, I'm jealous they have over 3,000 people Whoa. giving a dollar every day. For example, I got an email a few days ago that Boneolum got your dollar today. You're and part they, of it. You, you signed yes, up for it. Yes. And need to sign they up. give... Over three thousand dollars each day to a different organization. Right now, they've distributed over a million dollars thus far. They're on pace to do over one point three million dollars. I think it was one point seven. One point seven, even. Yeah, guys. But here's the here's yeah. the crazy part. This is the crazy. We spoke to the founder, and he's gonna hate me for saying this, and I won't say who he is. But I said, okay, but like, okay, this is a great idea, and you probably maybe get a, like some percentage. He's like. Every single dollar, every single dollar, every single cent goes straight to the organizations. They have different ways how they do it. You know, you could either give, you know, buy every every month or by the year because you can't give a dollar a day on a credit card and then it'll be like discontinued. But either way, the man takes zero and it goes directly to all these sadakas. You could give to all these sadakas in just a simple giving, a dollar a day, and they do all the work for you. And... Um, I, I just want to be transparent. How would how was this ad? You know, it's an ad where we'll be transparent. This ad wasn't paid for by the money that's donated to Daily Giving. Right. They had someone go ahead and say, we want to promote on this podcast because we think that the audience will sign up for Daily Giving. So guys, the ball's in your court. Go ahead over to dailygiving.org and start giving a dollar a day. It's going to go to so many different organizations, High Lifeline, Hass, Boney Olam, so many more. And and if you're like, oh man, I'm having kidney stones and I want to give more tzedakah, boom, AMR and daily giving. <laughs> it's a weird combo, but like these are such good solutions. Okay, enjoy the rest <laughs> of the episode. And you mentioned, it's funny that you mentioned that how much how much could women wait, raise already? You guys are, not to jump ahead too much, but this Vizakini project that has been going on now where you're trying to get 18,000 women to give a dollar a week to... I guess fund a couple a week. Right. You're you have close to over sixteen thousand women that are already involved in that. Right. So so, so to so, answer so that, everybody. I hate to disappoint you. Just a small change for us. But I will. We need t- millions. To spend the year. <laughs> but millions. I will tell you, right. I would not make machnas tavek with this because every dime, no every means. penny <laughs> counts. And in Boney Olam, right. it's very chashiv to us. Anybody who donates any amount. Of course, we need a lot, right? But every and you know, Boney Olam is really built as an organization of volunteers. It's not. Yes, we have an office. Yes, there are people paid, but not the amount of what we do comparatively and how many people are actually working to get paid. We have volunteers in every part of the world. That every event of ours is not done by the people who work in the office. It's done by the volunteers in the neighborhood that they are. You pick a neighborhood, and I'll tell you, we have a team. It was a built, we built it up with a team of volunteers that came and joined. And, you know, it was with a lot of work to build up all those volunteers, and they became family to us. We are real family friends. We go to their simchas. I mean, now, you know, with COVID and all that, but we really, we join in with them. I mean, my husband sometimes, he literally has to have someone driving from at night from Simcha to Simcha. He hops in, in and out, because can I know her, Baruch Hashem. But these are people that 
they are volunteering their precious time to go help other Yidin have children. From the day Boyd Island became an organization till now, I think we raised close to $130 million for this course. Wow. And, and this was done with a lot of people working tirelessly, and mainly those volunteers in every single neighborhood. Not to say that our office, our counselors, our, our, our office staff, any department in, 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 by us is not valuable, very valuable. We couldn't do without them either. But the core of Bone Olam is heart. It's done with heart. Any event, you know, everybody, you know, sometimes, you know, you make an event and not everybody agrees on something until you get it all hashed out. It, it, it's, it's a lot, but it's done with heart. Everybody wants to succeed so that we can help the couples. Worldwide, we have, I think, 68 people that return calls, medical calls. From them, I would say maybe only seven, eight are paid. The rest are volunteers. The rest are all volunteers if, that they, if, they call back. If Boniom were to get an additional $10 million a year, do you think you would be able to do more with that? Absolutely, because in research, there's so much we can... Look, we identified through our staff 23 new genetic mutations in Ashkenazi Jews. There's so much more we can, we can do. So with more money, you'll be able to Absolute. do more research. It's a fact. You're saying more money, more children. Yes, Absolutely. You, more money, is, is more healthy children. And, and healthy children. Mm. Is it public what... What's the annual budget for Boney Olam? Yeah, there's nine nineties is a statement. Sure. I, I think I recall. Is, is it around ten million a year? Ten, eleven floats. And if if you were to be bringing in twenty million, you'd be able to. Absolutely. Do you think you you directly research. be able to bring more children into the world? Absolutely, absolutely. Of course, you know how many help. people let's say that have used us to a certain point, and we just at certain times don't have enough more money to go through them. They stop. They give up. We go back. So if there's money, this is not a question, not an issue, right? Let me ask you guys each, there's a question for both of you. Is there a particular story from, I'm sure there's millions of stories that you guys are, are dealt with that, that tugs at your heart specifically from Bone Olam? Tug your heart or teach you a lesson? Both are good. We had one story which has been actually a driving force for me for a long, long time. We had this couple from Europe that that particular place in Europe called me once. They opened up a branch. They wanted me to come down and speak. It was an inaugural dinner. I went down because wherever I can open up a base, this is really like a mission in life to help more people. And it was a nice, it was like, I think, 400 people by the dinner, which is for that little town. There was a lot of people. I didn't yet know the, the full demographics from the place, but it was a very moving first dinner. And after... The dinner, everybody went home. I was waiting for my crew to take me home to my place because it was going to fly off the next morning. I noticed there was a, a man standing alone, like far away from me. So I, I sensed him probably wants to talk to me. So I went over to him. Yeah, Are you waiting for me? He said, yes. So he said, I was embarrassed to come home. So I, so I tell him, what's, what's the issue? So he tells me his medical history. And it, it was... <laughs> very, very, very not good. And he asked, uh, asked him, how can I help you? He says, I would like to try once in the United States. But the truth is America today is the, for, the run, front runner in all these treatments. Nobody has the success that the United States has, mainly based between New York and New Jersey. Good centers and good labs. So we're talking here approximately 45 to 50 grand to try. It was very expensive. And okay, I said, we'll, do, we'll see what we can do. After... He said, good night, goodbye. My guys came and said, can we go home? And one of them asked me, well, what did this person speak to you? So I told them. So they laughed. They said, this entire dinner was put together for him. We got the entire community to be here to support this person. This person was going through a hard time. It was a very hushing one in the neighborhood. So the whole dinner was put together for this person. So finally, when the time came, when he came to America, so my job was to introduce him to the doctor, to the surgeon, the doctor. And I told the doctor, you know, a very interesting story about this patient. This patient is coming here from that, that city in Europe. But you know, doc, the entire community came out to support him, to wish him well. It was like one huge family from almost 500 people. He looked at me and it was like a little bit unbelievable. I said, this is the story because I don't have a base over there. So they all get fine. And we just left. They came. 
Uh, honestly, we didn't expect any great news because he had failed there two, three times before. So we didn't think anything was going to happen out of here. So when, this, when the treatment surgery was over, the doctor came out. Unfortunately, I failed. So it was like a dagger in your heart. We went through a hard time. And you can imagine how so many people in Europe were following the news where it came from. It was a really a letdown. So in the hospital, it works like this. You can, there's two steps to each treatment. After the doctor initially can't be successful whatever he was doing for it. they give over everything to the pathology sometimes overnight the pathology they might be successful it doesn't happen that often but that's the last resort that we have so the couple was said no they went home sleep doctor came at five o'clock in the morning yeah i'm talking here somebody who's really big i mean the biggest in the world is guy and he looks through all the reports from the pathology and he saw this case like i had a little x on top that they were not with slich so upset he put on his white coat he went back to the lab and you know doctors like him don't go to don't work in labs he asked back all for his slides and lo and behold i think he found one or two cells he called a couple to come back in the morning and the guys didn't know why he calling me back but we were told let's just come back and to make a long story short they had a beautiful little baby i called the doctor that day to congratulate him i said wow he says what's this wow didn't you tell me that a whole town came out to support him and, and to be wish him well? How can I turn down so many hundreds of people? You know, I had to try something more than the usual because I, can't, I you can't do this to people, to so many people. My comment made him go back into the lab. Did I know what I was saying? Hashem, <laughs> and Buch Hashem, he had a beautiful little baby. Now there's a, a life. There's a boy walking not around. Not just a life. Just This is a future children. Yeah. Actually, he just called me not too long ago. The the child or the doctor? No, the yeah. father. The oh, father. The, the father. father. Oh. No. Wow. Miss Doc. The child by now is already seven, eight years old. It's oh, at wow. least seven, eight years since the story. Each child is a safer tower. Right. And what's crazy is you could be walking on the street here and you could be walking past children that are yours and you won't even know. We were together in Israel. There is a nobody. I, I, uh, I we, thought we nobody knows nobody us. us. <laughs> we're talking good many years ago, Shlomo. Five, six years ago. That's we not walked, too we, good. <laughs> we walked out on one of the hotels. We we're walking on Gula, and a couple comes running with the baby uh, carriage. The baby carriage. Are you an invalid? Mm. I said yes. I said, look, this is this, this is your baby. <laughs> And she tells me, look at that carriage. <laughs> <laughs> this is so funny. Now introducing a new Boni Olam feature. Yeah. <laughs> but this is such a... Bugaboos. It was very... Yeah. Then we went shopping for jewelry. And, yes, and, and that, then the malls. And then and another that lady, one And that lady who served us, she says, after a few minutes, she says, are you... And if it, I said, yes. She flips up her phone. Beautiful baby. Wow. Mm. Wherever was, we went. There were people that would, we have touched I, I, basically every every family or extended family. In, in all, all, all in types of Yiddish guy, whether it's modern Orthodox, yes, Hasidish, yes. Yes. Sephardi, across Ashkenazi. Across the across spectrum. The does it, does Yiddish it, spectrum. Do, do you feel it? Like, does it get to you? I don't walk that way. You don't walk that no, way? because You it, know, we, you know, people think, oh, we just had this event or that event and we're so successful. We're on to the next one and An the next one. An hour after the event, we're already working. It's, it's like nothing happened. We're busy right. with that. No, but I'm saying when, when a when a no. when a child when someone comes over with a child. I mean, oh, with a child. Because and they I, show it to you. Do, do you no, feel I, it? You have to remember. I work on myself to remember. Shlema, the Rebbein Shlema was here. The Rebbein Shlema gave it. It's not you. Remember. It, it wows us. Right, but I, I can imagine it's also. I mean, t- to to not feel it is also. I mean, you're putting so much time and effort and years. <laughs> Sometimes you have to. But you, each child is like, wow, Hashem did this because. Trust me, you know, it wouldn't happen. We know we, you know, people, people have a business and they work and they work and they're not successful. You could be working and working. This is all, every single, everything. You know, sometimes whenever we do an event, it's like, oh my God, like, I don't know, are people coming? Is it going to mm-hmm. happen? But it's it really true that each time you have to put in so much work. And, and I say the rest Yo, and the, he always, he's always telling me, honey, I don't know what's going to be. The dinner, we don't have a book. You know, you have the journals. Right. And it's nothing. It's four days left. And, and I don't know. I said, Shlami, did you go and work your heart out here? You went every night till two, three in the morning. You had meetings. You went to everyone and asked and did. Now, you have to calm down and say, Hashem has it. It's all in his hands. He's controlling it. He's making it happen. And he's going to make it happen. And also for good news, 
unfortunately, every day he has good news. You unfortunately right. live right. along with very sad. That's just the nature too. of the business. So right. it's a very um, it's not a nature. I get it's funny. I get more moves for the people that fail than the people that were successful. Because, what do you mean by because that? Because Hashem, they're happy. Mm-hmm. They're done. Like the job is done. My heart goes with those that I always tell people. Till now, you were my only one and only child. I took care of you. The moment you are Hashem Matzlich, I'm on to the next. Mm. Now he's the, he's the Ben Yochet now because then he, yes, it's it's a very it's a big emotional fight every day, but it's very hard to talk about it because it's a struggle. Do you, do you? This is a hard question. Do you guys get down by the fact that you didn't have children? Does that still or, or are you like you're you're past that? No, I don't, nobody gets past that. You don't, you, don't. It, you don't get past it. It's you know something that you're living with every day. But you definitely feel like, at least I'm doing something for other people. That that was the point when we started it. Right. I want to mm-hmm. just help people. I mean, you kept asking me like, you didn't have enough. You channel that pain. Right. In other words, I, I want to help other people. Let, let let other people have at least. Well, then she's on a higher level than I am. <laughs> <laughs> a higher level. It's just. It's hurtful. All, it's, all it's, our words. It's, it's painful. It's I, painful. I, I'll be lying if I say that. It's painful, it but hurt. it hurts. But definitely, um, listen. I always, I even like if people call me on the phone asking me for, I, I don't work in the office, I'm a volunteer. So if people call me privately and they ask, how do you do it? How do you go on every day? You have to look at all the positives, be grateful for everything that Hashem has given you up until now and just move forward. I'm not someone who sits and wallows. You just have to. I'm sure there are if, bad days also. Sure there are, absolutely. But mm-hmm. you cry privately. Mm-hmm. Right. The That's world. such a good mindset. You, you don't, you don't, you, you guys to. both. I mean, you, you know, you, you, you're, you're a little older than us, but you don't stop. You <laughs> keep little, just a little. You older. keep on moving. One of the, one one of the first. Right. I don't have a choice. Yeah. The phone keeps on ringing. There's, it's not that I'm looking it, for it. <laughs> they, nobody leaves you alone. Honestly, the phone right. does not stop. But I, I don't get to talk to him. Just driving here. That's why we brought you in here, so you guys can spend the time together. The next five minutes, you can just talk together. Wow, honey, we travel for an hour to talk. It's no, but it's true. I really, you know, he'll say, "You didn't tell me this." I said, "How could I?" <laughs> I don't get a chance. Well, one of my first impressions when when you guys walk downstairs is you guys are really young. You know, you really have a lot of life to you. It's I work mindset. harder than my entire grade at this age. They're long gone. They're like people long in Florida. I'm the only one who works literally 22 hours a day. It's like nonstop. But again, it wasn't by choice. I'm being. Do you, you do you, you how, how many hours do you sleep a night? There are nights <laughs> that I sleep literally not more than an hour and a half or two hours. A Certain lot. things don't uh, let you an sleep. An hour and a half, two hours. Long stretches. Does that does that so, happen? Like, well, now with this uh, this last event that he did, maybe even less. He slept very little. Like I mean, in a week, and, and, <laughs> in a week. In a week it, 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 first of all, certain worries and things that right, you know you're problem, supposed to have a moon of a on, but it's you still on your head and it's on your shoulders. So you thinking about it, and and it wake certain things wake you up, right? You know. And until he you gets to sleep. You can't be involved in, like I said before, you can't be involved in an organization like this which deals with people's lives, with people's feelings, people's hurt, people's pain, people's shidduchim, people's children. When you decide now... Now I'm on vacation. Now I'm taking off. You can't. It doesn't work. Do you, do you take vacation ever? No. We have never. taken vacation yeah. since we started the organization. Wow. I was going to ask you, where, where do you... Is because there a she claimed... place that you go? No, to? because she claims the vacation is if you're going to leave the phone behind. <laughs> And you can't leave the phone. Or at least because put it aside for a little bit. Even if you want to eat. No, that's right there. I sleep with it's the with phone his under pillow. my pillow. I'm curious. Shabbos, Yant of every, I'm curious. Really. Shabbos, you're, you, you have it on you. I have you're, it on you're, me. You're hot solo in a had, certain we way. We had people that were We'd hyper-stimulating in Shabbos and I was afraid I might be. A, I only had to be Michal Shabbos once. But since, but it's it's we for me. We have people it's, coming on Yantif, knocking on doors. They're looking for medicine. That you know, they're traveling. They went to their parents or their in-laws. They forgot something or oh, they ran man. out of it. And, it, it, you right. know, you don't know the process, but they find out just the night before how much they need to take as far as stimulating. Yeah, it's These certain things are emergencies. So you can't we even had shit. upstate. We were in the yeah. country on Shabbos and someone walked from one colony pretty far to us Shabbos to, afternoon. on Shabbos afternoon. Wow. Yeah. It was a very sad story. I mean, so what well, I means Friday, Shabbos afternoon, everybody wants to take a nap, right? Mm. I don't always have the luxury to take I a woke nap. Him, I, I wasn't sleeping yet. And, and he was sleeping. And I said, What should I do? I better go wake him. Like, I didn't know what. Right. It's, so do you, do you, uh, is there anything you do to like have fun, to relax, to. We try to, but listen. Like, really, what have we done what actually have we to done? relax? 
can't think of something. <laughs> <laughs> no? You play tennis, go swimming. I, we, I do. You play tennis. I, stay. Um, mm. I haven't done it in a long time. Okay. <laughs> long yeah, time. you did no. in 1984. Okay. Actually, oh, yeah. actually, she got me to go to a physical therapist because of my left that's shoulder. That's what you do for fun? <laughs> no, that's, no, not that's, for fun. that's, that's where I'm relaxing. <laughs> they can't do nothing. You have to be locked into the room. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. We no. try. We try. It's, you know. It's either you're responsible for clothes. I always say this. When people ask me the question, it's not that you. It's either you do it or you don't. You can't be, and I didn't do it by choice. This is one thing which makes me always feel good. Hashem, you know, I really, I really wasn't looking for this. I'm not looking to be the person in Klaus, my picture, my name, all that. I, I'm a very private person. He put it I would love into our seicha. We didn't, cho- I, I, like, Hashem, even with Hashem, that, yeah. Hashem put it into, you know, like, whatever ideas, or even like, you know, all of a sudden, an idea pops in, or, you know, you're doing an event and you need to go and get an honoree. Yeah. Where do I get the names? As some people give names and some people pops into your head. And when I go to that person, I said, I didn't choose it. Hashem is knocking at the door. The couples are knocking at the door, not me. Let, 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 me, let me give a, a little for instance that happened just a few weeks ago. This lady calls me up from Muncie, New York. I helped her 15 years ago have a baby child. child. She had no money. She was here from, I think from Israel, had no money. I helped her. She had a baby. A year or two later, she calls me up. Can you please help me have another child? In those days, second late, lately, I have not been given for secondary because I have so many primaries. I can't, I can't even move to secondary. Now, actually, this charity campaign we took upon ourselves, if we reach $6 million, mm-hmm. we got, and we actually have a Hashem already in 6.2. secondary. 6.485. How many cents? 6.487, actually. <laughs> it was the last count. And this lady calls me up that time that she needs my help, then I hear a baby crying. So I tell her on the phone, go back, tend to your baby, and then you, you call me back. She said, no, no, I, 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 no, there's no need for me to go to the baby. I said, why? Something's told me, because the baby's crying for milk, I have no milk in the fridge. That's how poor she was. So what do you say? My fridge is empty and the baby's crying. For the baby. So I'll call you back in a few minutes. I called the New Square, our connection there, like a half an hour later, that truck pulled up to the house. First, we filled up her fridge. The baby she had moved. Mm-hmm. Then we went back to the tree. We were having another baby. So she had another baby with Hashem. The second baby was a boy. She calls me up last year. I haven't had no connection with her all these years. She says, you know, your child is becoming by mitzvah. I think you should come with us. My child come by mitzvah. What are you talking about? She reminded me in the second year, she had like a very distinct voice. And, yeah, yeah, so my child, I mean, come, come to the midst of be so nice to family. You know, I always tell my children, that you have a saba, a, a grandfather. So she got me so emotional, I said, I'm going to come. I came to the midst of, I was there, I took pictures, I was there for a few minutes, beautiful boy, the midst of fine, left. She calls me up now, literally before the summer, and she says, I need a favor from you. <laughs> I'm <laughs> getting ready for something big to come. She has Canaan by now, a family, she has Panos, she says, fine. She says, my Son is finishing now school, graduating the, the whatever grade. He now is going into the higher level of the yeshiva, and no yeshiva wants to accept him. I need your help to get my child into the yeshiva. Where in the world am I getting involved in that? <laughs> this is even more complicated than, than having a couple of a baby. But I really have no connect. And so she saw that was hesitating. She says, Mr. Bachner, Tell me, how would you feel if you knew your son is roaming the streets and doesn't have a yeshiva to go into? But she knew the right buttons to push. Yeah, wow. Well. And for a second, I was a little upset. Why is she, why is she putting him in the corner? But then the second, I said, well, she's right. I worked very hard the child should be born. There is definitely some kind of a connection that Hashem wants. I took some details. I said, I'll get back to you. I knew I had nowhere where to go. Because where, where, who do I know? My mother... But she told me which yeshiva she wanted to get the boy into. While I was sitting, what do I do here? I reminded myself that the, one of the people that runs that yeshiva, I helped out many years ago, one of his children. So I called up one of my people that says, this is the story, I want you to go. She said, well, hold a second. If they don't want to take him in, there's gotta be a reason. So I told my, my friend, I don't care what reasons. It's my child, it's my son. I want my son in the yeshiva. Are you going to do it for me or not? Different kind of a language. He called me back the next day. He says, all I was able to do is to get him an appointment to go for a, fair, a test. 
So I called back the father. And I, the father's big time. I told him, you're not opening up a safer for yourself for the next six, seven days. You're going to learn with your son and get him ready the best you can. And so he did, but unfortunately, he, he's not at that level. He was, so they call me up. They, 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 they can't. He's not going to fit in. And the curriculum, you know, all the, all the other stuff. Though. I called back my friend and said, listen to me. Are you going to do it for me? If I'm going to have to do it myself, it's not going to be. It's not going to be. He says, why are you getting so worked up? You know how many kids a month you have no yeshiva, boys or girls? I told him, you forgot. This is my son. Mm -hmm. I want my son in the yeshiva. That worked. <laughs> He's in the yeshiva. He's accepted. It's fine. Yes, we have to promise that he'll have a private tutor to help him out. Think about that story. And many times it crosses my mind. My child is not the yeshiva. I don't even know how the child looks even. I saw him once by Mehmet Sutur. But it's true. We worked very hard as a child to be born. There is, there is, she was able to, I don't know, to ingrain in my mind, I have an achrais. And look, I was metzliach. Bottom line, I was metzliach. I could have said, no, it's not my field. So does Hashem prepare for you to work? Absolutely. Where do I come? Where do I come into this whole field? So after the child was accepted in Shiva, actually, I said, now you owe me one. Because I really went above and beyond, and believe me, I'm using that schus for whatever I need. Shem should help me should be one slave. I really went out of my box. What does it prove to you? Everybody can walk out of their comfort zone. Everybody could be one slave a little bit more, a little bit less. We all have to try. It has to. Nothing's below you, right? It has to hurt you. It has to, you have to feel. You have to be able to walk into other people's shoes for a few minutes and feel, because everybody can be helpful. If anybody knows me from the past, I'm a totally different human being. I never in my life asked anybody for anything. I was raised in a home. With my, my mother, Leah, she used to tell us, Kindlech, if we don't have it, then we don't need it. Not that we had to go above and beyond. This is how we were raised. We come from a beautiful family, whatever, whatever the limits we had. Who am I to go ask people for big money, fifty, hundred thousand, hundred thousand, million dollars? Who, who am I? But somehow, because I believed in the cause and I knew who I need this money for, I had the chutzpah to ask. And I used to tell them, I'm not asking you. I, I'm representing. If you want, I can bring those people in and they're going to ask you. Which is messengers. Right? She's very proud that she was able to make me whatever I was. <laughs> what I'm taking out from that story is also if someone, um, well, nine, almost 9,000 children, if they're having a struggle getting into a yeshiva, a yeshiva don't you dare. Oh, gosh. Don't or if you get more schlossim. Get more schlossim. <laughs> no, but you did your part. You did <laughs> it doesn't mean I was going to be a slich everywhere. Somehow, I, I, again, this is, I understand. This is what Hashem wanted for me. I really had no chance because of the, I know I see now after the test that the kid really did not is not in that level. But I was able to be. Who knows? In Shema, in business Shema had a connection to me. I was supposed to get it. We don't understand that stuff. But we shouldn't shy away from trying. We, you, you never know. You never know. Well, we have a question I like to ask our guests. If you could go back in history and speak to one person for an hour. Who would your person be? Someone who's no longer with us is a question for both of you. I'll give her the first chance to answer. I'll give it to you. <laughs> I'm throwing it to you. I saw that question actually, and I thought about it, and this question came up in my mind many, many times. I, to be honest with you, because I knew in the last generation of a lot of big tzaddik and big people which died unfortunately not having children, and I always used to tell myself, you know, if I only had a chance. To help those people, they would have been most probably the most the most happy people in the world. And three, four people come to my mind. The first one comes to my mind always is the Chazonish, because I, I read a lot. I was very close to Rav Steinman, very, very close. And it's funny because I'm a Chesidish person, and he's a very, but I was like a Ben Bias by him, really. And he, everything he spoke was from Israel, but the Chazonish, I got somehow gotten green the Chazonish. The Chazonish didn't have children. And we know, whoever knows the history of the Chazanish, he took it very hard. It wasn't easy. And even though he was the biggest Sadiq and he was able to be with some help, everybody with it, something which hurt him very much. We're only humans. Avram Avini couldn't make peace with it. And sometimes the Lubavitch never comes to my mind because I deal with a lot of Chabad people helping them out. And I sometimes wonder what the Rebbe would say, what the Rebbe would do. And I just think to myself, imagine if you could leave a successor behind him. Just imagine it's such a major movement. And many times come to the thought the Sapmarim which the man turned around the world. Same things with the last Gera Rebbe by Sisro. A man ran entire at Sisro. These people were such a great people. Can you imagine I'm all sitting by a table and I can tell them, and none of, I can none help of them you. had children? No. 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 So I can help you. 
At one point, I was going to open up a program where people can plant a tree and, and support a child being born in Schusva for the Chazon Somehow it didn't take off. But this is how much... Yeah. We I actually thought it was a very good idea. We relate to those people because unfortunately we go through the same pain. And let me tell you one thing. As big as you are, you can be the biggest person in the world, but the pain is the same. They You're might human. Be, they might be able to channel better than me, but it hurts just... I know many people went into something, whatever. I can't say many. I want one person... And he, was, he did not have kids, and he, be, he begged the Rebbe for a brucha. And the Rebbe didn't want to give him a brucha. I guess the Rebbe felt he can't give him a brucha. So the, the man told me himself the story. So I finally told the Rebbe, the Rebbe should know that it, it doesn't let me learn. I can't count on learning. So the Rebbe looks at him and says, Can't play in what's the minister? So he said, That's what that? he's. What do you think? You don't think that, <laughs> that, that, that it blocks me from learning too? The many times no. I'm just phased out because I have no children. So these were the, we're talking about the biggest people we had in the last 60, 70 years. I can only imagine if I can sit at a table together with them and I can say, I have something which we can, how grateful they would have been. Because I always believe the fertility, some people look at it like a little bit odd, is Hashem opened up the gateway for us that we should be able to have, give every, at least, a try. almost every possible, yeah. possible to have a, to have a child. But I do want to add one more point to that, which I think is important to know. Many years ago, we had a niece that had a um, she had a project in school. Everybody got like 10 questions. So one of my nieces came to me. One of her questions was, what was the most bizarre case I ever had to deal with? No, it's a very, it's an interesting question because we really have issues from, some people don't, would never even think of it when we have to get involved. But I once had a very interesting case. We had an agent of the Mossad in Israel that didn't have any children. And he had to go through a major, major procedure. But yet, we were not allowed to know who the person was. Do you understand? You don't know a patient. You don't know who Sounds the like a is. movie. <laughs> His rabbi called me and he said, listen to me, we're never going to reveal to you the name of this person because it's, it's dangerous for the person. If he's known, his life is in danger. I took upon myself the responsibility to be his advocate. All I need you is to prepare everything for me, and we're not going to be in contact until the treatment is over, so we can hide his. Um, because he's definitely going to go in there under a fictitious name. It's not going to be. What should I do? It's a from guy he wants to have a baby, works for the Mossad. <laughs> was a feeling a little bit, you know. You know what was very funny when I, I used to get the medical reports. Was there was no name? <laughs> like no, who are you dealing with? There's no name here. And the wife's name also not because I could trace it back from them. Right. All I knew was they were living somehow hidden in the kibbutz in 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 in, in, the, in the upper gale. I don't know where it was. But Hashem, we helped him. He had a baby boy. He sent me a clip. I have the clip put away because he doesn't let me use it. He walked into the shul holding his baby. This is safe at home. No, no he, 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 he screamed out Shmai. I never heard another yeet scream like this to the top of the lungs. Shmai Yisrael Hashem on the Kenya Hashem Achot. The entire issue, they knew who he was. Was it, it was some kind of a settlement? They would. Everybody was crying. Literally, I get the chills. But it's unfortunate he doesn't give me permission to. But you can't see a face. You can only see a man holding, dressed like an Israeli chalutznik, whatever, with a with kippah, holding the baby, bringing the baby into the bed. It was very emotional. Many years after that, we had a party. Someplace in Israel, a very wealthy guy did for us a party. And all of a sudden, I was about to go home. The party was in a garden. The garden was surrounded by trees. So what do I care what's behind the tree? I mean, it was dark at night. We were ready to go home. This was all planned, which I did not know. I was getting ready to move. All of a sudden, between the trees, a man walks in with a lady, with a carriage. He says, me shalom. I wanted to come and say thank you. I never had a chance to say thank you. But Hashem, he helped us have a baby. So from protocol, you don't ask, what's your name? <laughs> you don't do that. I don't know. Sometimes you have that fifth instinct. Like that. I don't know why. I just put my hands on the shoulder and said, Habibi, miyata, mashem shlacha. Like he, was, he wasn't expecting me to ask, but I had no clue who it was. He says, by now, he spoke a beautiful English, but he was an Israeli. I don't know what his position was in the Mossad. He says, by now I can tell you. Remember many years ago? I says, my gosh, this is you. <laughs> this is such a 
beautiful he felt baby. Like James Such a beautiful little baby. I have that clip put away. He did, he tracked you down. He's Messiah. Yes, they knew. They knew. They, they, they knew. He's actually here. Uh-huh. No, no. He wanted to come say anything. I don't know how he found that. I guess I don't know how it happened. I didn't even ask for those details, but it was very, very emotional. So that clip, he tells me, don't altafas I, I, My life could be in danger. But I told him how long you're still going to be in service after you. Are. My job, whatever I have done, my life will always be. You can't, you can't use me. Even keeping many times, I put on that clip to hear a yeet. I mean, he was. It was zero for him. No children, and he knew he doesn't have a chance, a fair chance, even to try to go for treatment. Right. When you hear that baby, now this is like the shechina was there. A question that we uh, what's that? We to, Mrs. We can't, we can't oh, let yeah. her off the it's hook. Okay. Yeah. We can't I let like her off the hook. So simple. He's very good. He, he lives these. I remember when he's telling me the story. I remember it, but he lives with these stories that they're happening on a daily basis. Is there somebody you would want to meet with? No. If if if, if, if there's somebody I, I, you'd want to sit with for an hour that you can no longer sit with. I'm not on the level that he is. <laughs> <laughs> You'd want to sit with your husband now, right now. <laughs> and talk to him. Yeah. Um, let me, let me, if you have an answer, please interrupt me. Um, we typically ask everyone what their favorite mitzvah is. I think Hashem chose for you bringing children into this world that, unless there's a different mitzvah. Should I say it's my favorite mitzvah? Oh, I, I don't I, know. Wor- I worked very hard for that Right. Mitzvah, yes, actually. And well, we're going to go up there and they're going to ask a sack to the <laughs> If you had children, without any, any physical enjoyment from it, yes, I was most nefesh for this, yeah. both of us, to the extreme. I mean, I can't even begin to tell you about this. Not, again, not because we're such a great people. Just this, this it, mitzvah it, asks you. It, it demands from you. If you're in it and you're doing it, you, you just can't do it halfway. Right. It demands. I remember one time there was a shidduch. Boy and girl got engaged. There was it was a Matzah Shabbos. Sunday morning, the two Mechatunim were supposed to meet to print the invitations. Over that weekend, they found out something wrong with the girl. A genetic issue. The father came running to my office, and he cried. So I, I, whatever medical information I had, I mean, it wasn't too great, but it is what it is. So I told him, look, I cannot tell you what to do because you need a bigger dance toy than me. I can just try to help you out with the medical information the best I can. He went to somebody which I was shocked. I really, since then, I tip my hat for this person. I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a rabbi, he's a, rabbi, he's a chushiver, but this rabbi went for this man into the thick woods, really, took upon himself to get married, and we'll take care of it later on. And they had a beautiful wedding, and everything worked out. I got him to that road that night because he would do it. So it was supposed to be much of Shabbos that, do I say that I love this mitzvah? This mitzvah made me work very, very hard in my life. Yes, I definitely accomplished that mitzvah more than anybody else did. But I go back to my first line. If I had the choice, if I wouldn't be pushed into this by force from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, don't think I would have been here the way I am. And now I thank Hashem that he gave me a meaning in life. He gave me a reason to live for. As, as we wind down, uh, this amazing conversation. I want to ask you guys something, um, and I'll give you both an opportunity to answer this. If somebody was sitting right here, somebody who's who's struggling to have kids, and you guess you you could talk as if you're talking directly to them. What what would you say to them? Hold on, I, I want to uh, change it just a little. Sure, but Mrs. Bachner, can you talk to a woman who's struggling, right. and and Rabbi Bachner, can you speak to a man who's struggling? Honey, this is your question, and you can speak for both. I'm just trying to understand the question. The question is, if, if you had a patient in front of you, what would be your best advice? I, advice? <laughs> yes. Yeah, or someone listening that's I, struggling themselves. Yes, I, and, I, I, I understand now. I would definitely say you have to first, you got to be positive. If you're going to go down the mm-hmm. road of, I don't know what's going to be, the worries and the the negativity I, I'll never have. I don't know. The doctor is not positive. First of all, doctor is not Hashem. And we had so many times that a doctor would tell a couple, hair's going to grow on this side. You are never going to have. And they had. So there's a God, and we believe in that, and we have to be positive. And you've, I, I found in life, if you go with positive thoughts and move forward, not go and lay in bed and wallow in your pain. 
it, it, it helps you move forward. You got to keep on going and keep on, you know, working at everything that could make you happy in that moment. I would tell the couple is you got to also, you know, distract yourselves and get out of the mode of, oh, we're going to the doctor and nachamol and nachamol, go again and again for treatment. Give yourself a little space. Do things together, things that are enjoyable, things that are happy. Even get involved in, in a mitzvah that might not even have anything to do with children. Do it for somebody else. Or as, as a schus, I actually tell, I, this I always tell the couple, go and get out of your comfort zone. Go do something that is so hard for you to really do. It's not your nature to do it. Whatever type of mitzvah that you could think of, that is something that you, it's hard for you to do, and you're going to do it with a lot of heart. It could be time that you're spending. It could be money. Anything that it's going to be a little, it's going to give you a kvetch. On the, on the medical end, what would you tell people? On the medical end, I would say, Make sure that any doctor that you go to, get all your records. In other words, whatever you, whoever you're going to, request your records because you never know if you, you're not always might not always stay with that doctor. Mm -hmm. It's very important to have those records to go on to the next one, and it's also not not something to be embarrassed to go and say I want to go for a second opinion. In fact, it's sometimes very important to go for a second opinion. It, it's we teach people to be their own advocate they should understand advocate. what they're doing they'll be much more intelligent and can be able to make decisions when there's nobody to be reached not always you know like this doctor said this and he, they think that's the law it's not always the case sometimes they do know what they're talking about so especially if they're going if they prior to coming to us and they've been going down the road to this one that one this one and they're all mixed up and they feel like i, I don't know who to listen to then of course that's where Boneolum really comes in and helps them out. But they should be their own patient advocate, they should listen, they should keep records, they should... Um, very important, they should always be very respectful to the staff, nurses and doctors, yes. even though sometimes they feel like they may be a little bit slighted because you know, we have seen this down the road, you're gonna need them back for something. It's always good to be, we're Yidin, we're different. We have, we have a-, a And a you kid. have to make a Kiddush Hashem, and right. you have to make for the next couple right. that's gonna go. You know, you think, oh, I'm done with this doctor or whatever, and you might be very not nice. It's really the wrong thing. Or even this, the sec, I wanna tell you something. Those secretaries in the doctor's office, you'd be very nice to them. That's any, in any company. Yeah, they can get you many <laughs> it's places. It's the secretaries that really run the company. You should know that. You'd be good to them, because they'll get you that appointment. You sometimes have an emergency question. They'll squeeze you in to get that answer. You, you got to behave. The, the, the last question we have for you is, okay, obviously, anyone listening, if they want to help Bone Olam from a financial standpoint, they could go on boneolam.com. Dot org. And dot com. I don't know. Dot org. Dot org. Sorry. And give as much as they can, always. Or they um, can actually go and volunteer and say, I want to make an event. Right. I want to do a parlor meeting. I want to do a, a party. And I want to do a bake sale. I want to do different communities. Do, in different communities. Every not community only for does money. Different. People get to learn. And right. learn. Awareness. Awareness. It's very important for us. When I come down to speak, I always will pick a medical topic. Not only the money part. It's the med Right. There are always people there which... You know, it might be it might be pertaining to me, to my neighbor, to my daughter, to my child. I, I always carry along this mitzvah, and wherever, at any occasion, even totally unrelated, let's say it's only fundraising, I will always devote a certain amount of time, something new, medical, new knowledge. Because people new, hear about it and they say, hey, maybe, you know, that's, I, I heard my friend is going through something like that particular nice and right. they well, could help them. What would you tell them to... Um, expect like they 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 maybe have a friend or they have people that in their life that they know are struggling. What's the best they thing? Should, advice? They should call me. They should call you. Yeah, but like, the couple, I, I can the couple them should call. To. Yeah, no, no, no. The, but, the friends but, of the but couple. But the friends. Let me tell you something. Yeah, advice to parents, to in laws, to, uh, to to siblings. The advice: don't ask questions. Never ask why a couples can't come to a certain simcha or to attend. Anything that it's the family yeah. reunion, very important. Don't ask questions. Offer money. Don't ask anything. Are you going for treatments? What? Can, just open your heart, open your pocketbook, and give. 
I'm actually dealing now with a couple, which for years, they haven't kissed many years. And it's funny, just recently I got a call from a lady in Barapak. I don't know who she is. She says, this, this couple is a very famous, they come from a very famous family. They can't divulge their identity and they're, they're struggling. I told the lady, tell them, I'm giving you my personal cell phone. You're not going through the system, not through the company, nobody's, tra nobody's tracking your phone call. Let them call me on a personal level. They don't even have to tell me who they are. I'll answer the question, if they need more, we'll most times it works like magic because they're getting a person's private personal cell phone. It's not being public. They, they, you make them try to make them very come. Let me conclude with this. Once I got involved today with this mitzvah, I have this, also this interesting, maybe people call it a little bit OCD. I will not go to sleep at night if I haven't returned my phone calls. I can call back one o'clock in the morning. I know the person's not picking up. Just to let them know, I'm sorry, I couldn't make it to you, but you call meant to me something. We'll talk tomorrow, we'll talk after tomorrow. Because I remember our times when I ran around, there was nobody to talk to. I mean, if you called somebody, they never got back to you. Well, they didn't know what to answer you. I went to her, one of them they told me. I can tell you that he travels. I mean, this is not our Parnassa. We do this voluntarily. Yeah, by the way, he we're not. Yeah, not, you have like a coat, he, something. He works in essence of you ladies wear, and he's the buyer for the coat. So he has to travel. That's where you got that nice piece, huh? <laughs> <laughs> for those <laughs> listening, for he's sure. wearing a very nice. But, but he actually, like he's at the show, <clears throat> and he's on the phone from company to company. I'm trying on the coats, checking it out or whatever, <laughs> co-worker with him. And he's on the phone, and he, the person can't believe that I said, I'm in Hong Kong now. He says, what? You're calling me from Hong Kong? It really shows the couples our concern and our love for them, and they're not just a number, even though they do get a PIN number because of the privacy issue here, which we're very medactic about, but that we really care for them and what they're going through. And when someone actually fails, and that we say, we call them up, are you interested in going again? And they can't believe it because we're calling even them. We know that you're going through something difficult. And just because they weren't successful at this, you know, not everyone, it's a, just because they weren't successful, they can't have kids. That's where we're always giving again and again. And so when we're fundraising and we go and we go to a person, we say, can you give us another 18,000 or something like that? And they say, what? I just gave you. I said, yeah, that was last year. I said, that couple, he went three times this year. What should I tell them? Should I tell them no? It's so we care and we don't want to stop giving. And the only way we can't, we, we don't stop giving is if everybody will keep on giving so that we can be the shlichim for all those people who are doing the mitzvahs and giving it for the couples. You guys are really brave and incredible. Thank you for opening up to us and all our listeners. And Hashem should give you kayak to continue oh, doing Amen. everything you're doing. That is what we need. Kayak. And Hashem should give you a lot of vacations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed episode number 19 of the Meaningful Fuel podcast. It was really an eye-opening conversation. These two people did so much for the world and, and they, they continue to. Yeah. So, you know, we mentioned this campaign, Vizakeni, that they're getting 18,000 women to give a dollar a week to fund a couple's treatments and they reached that goal i think uh a week after we f we we shot this episode and now i think they're working on uh, another one so Vizakini campaign is a success and everything they do is incredible you can head to their website boneolam.org and learn about how you can help them in your community hosting events for them and just bringing awareness of the amazing work that they're and, doing and and being and being the part and help bringing jewish children children into the world like right. you could it you know there's there's a lot of financials uh that really that doesn't make sense but we'll continue going there's a, if money is a big barrier unfortunately and the more money the more funding they have the more children could be born it, it's it's wild it is and, and we're looking forward to our next episode where you're going to hear from Mr. Saul Werdiger. Also known as Schleima Werdiger. Also known as Schleima Werdiger. And if you know him, great. We, we were very excited for that episode and he blew us both away. Yeah, really, really interesting. And you'll see that soon. So hope you enjoyed this one. And don't forget, as we just, you know, as we mentioned before, dailygiving.org. You know, we hope you listen to the whole podcast 
And now that you finished it, literally just go check it out. Go check it out. It's it's wild what they're doing. Go on, go on your phone. Go on dailygiving.org. If you know how to spell those words, then <laughs> great. I, and I, I want to do something new. So you finish off with chow, right? Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna finish off every time. I'm gonna this I'm gonna stick to. I'm gonna like say a catchphrase, but like I'll always switch it up. Okay. So thanks for listening to the Meaningful People podcast, and and always remember to love Hashem. Ciao.